Welcome again to First Asia Conversations. I'm your host, Noah Berlatsky. Um, and this is going to be the last First Asia Conversations of the year. And it's also going to be the last one we do for a while, I think. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, I'm moving on to new opportunities, so I will no longer be the host. Um, and second of all, in the past, doing these videos has resulted in guests being harassed. Um, doing this child protection work is extremely controversial and dangerous, and so people become targets, and, you know, we want to be able to make sure that people are safe when they come on. So we're going to put pause on this series for a while. Um, but today we're going to be having a clip a series of clips and anthology of clips of conversations we've had over the last year for our final Prestasia Conversations of the year and for a while. So thank you for tuning in and um, yeah, we'll get started. I think everybody takes this very seriously. This is, uh, you know, child sexual abuse and child abuse and neglect on a broader scale are, are can be quite devastating to to the children that experiences those and to the children that engage in those behaviors um, and are identified as as you know offenders and as well as to adults who engage in those behaviors. So the harm is very very real. We do as a nation uh, take this very seriously, but we put most of our intervention and most of our resources into after the fact strategies. So it, particularly robustly, we uh, try to um, identify. Uh, uh, convict and and punish offenders and certainly we do want to hold adults accountable appropriately accountable for harmful behavior against children but I'll just say that national data publicly available data indicates that we spend as a nation about six billion dollars each year to incarcerate sex offenders in federal and in state prisons so six billion dollars a year by contrast we currently, our federal budget currently has $1 million, $1 million allocated towards child sexual abuse prevention research. So, wow. and that money has only been around this year. Wow. Before 2020, we did not have any money that was designated in the federal budget that I was ever able to find, certainly, that, that was specific to child sexual abuse prevention because I think child sexual abuse is often viewed inaccurately as unpreventable. Yeah. There is, as you well know, Jeremy, this idea that people that engage in these behaviors are monsters. And the unfortunate, um, the unfortunate thing about that monster metaphor is that it really puts blinders on us. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it means we don't, you know, you can't predict or prevent what a monster is going to do. Yeah. So the only thing you can do is just clean up the mess after it happens, which is a terrible way to to only focus on child sexual abuse. It's absolutely important, again, I want to be super clear, to hold adults appropriately accountable for their behaviors. But we can't only do that and ever get ahead of this problem. Um, recidivism, reoffending, accounts for very little of uh, annual new uh, victimizations. We've got to focus more on primary prevention, but we view it as unpreventable, we being the public and, and policymakers who represent the public. The other thing with the monster metaphor that is so damaging is it blinds us to the people in our lives who we know and love and care about who might be engaging in inappropriate or harmful behavior. And so that blinds us to doing anything about that until uh, until it's too late. And we see example after example, Larry Nasser and Jerry Sandusky and, and other people that offended with impunity for decades, uh, where people knew what was going on, but I think many of them just didn't believe that someone they cared about or liked or respected would actually do that. Um, so, you know, part of our um, mission as a center is to really shift the paradigm past this idea that um, anyone who engages in these behaviors are monsters to, 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 to a much more nuanced understanding that, you know, this is, this is a preventable public health problem and that there are people who are at risk who don't ever want to engage in these behaviors. There are people at risk who don't know that they might engage in these behaviors, either because they're young or because they're just unaware for other reasons. And to really try to, to, to 
uh, prevent children from being harmed in the first place, which we think is equally important to addressing the needs of survivors, very, very important, and to holding adults accountable and to getting children who have made mistakes back on the right track and children who have engaged in harmful behaviors back on the right track. Um, but p primary prevention, really moving in before harm has occurred, deserves a bigger platform and definitely deserves more resources. Oh, misconceptions and fears. I think the major fear that everyone has is that they're not normal. Mm. Interesting. So a lot of people just want to be told, your experience is normal, or there is no normal. Mm. Like, sex is weird for everyone. Right. <laughs> and there is no kinky, because there is no normal. There's oh, just common and less common. So I think that's a major fear that people have is, oh my gosh, my experience isn't normal. I'm too this or too little that or mm -hmm. too much that or no one else has this. I'll never find someone else who mm -hmm. has that same belief or fantasy mm -hmm. or desire or, or need. And so I would say that that is people's biggest fear. And then maybe the misconception is that there is a normal. Okay. If we can help eliminate stigma and create support for minor attracted persons, it naturally, uh, naturally creates prevention. And so we know that there's research that is out there that says if we are providing to su the support for minor attracted persons who are in need of mental health, again, support, um, not because they're child molesters, you know, pedophilia doesn't automatically equal pe uh, child molestation. Um, but if we can help eliminate some of the stigma and decrease some of the shame, we naturally are providing prevention. So Dr. Tenbergen, do you want to add to that? Yes, just the idea that if the only thing we're addressing, if we advertise this or if we come off saying, oh, hey, we're here only for abuse prevention that's only part of that's only part of the equation again as many psychologists and, and individuals who are trained in treatment provision are very fond of saying desperate people do desperate things in desperate times and that goes for many 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 different diagnoses so it it stands to reason that let's start treating minor attracted individuals the same way we would treat other human beings. Mm -hmm. If we don't make that step, if we don't start reducing some of the obstacles to get to treatment, to get to support, then all we're doing is making abuse inevitable. That's a really huge question. Um, I tend to be, if I'm honest, a bit pessimistic about these things. Um, I don't think that there is any meaningful movement in the United States. Um, obviously, there are isolated campaigns, but there has been very little meaningful legislation proposed. Um, and right now, child battery is sanctioned by the state in uh, all of the United States. In other words, spanking is legal in all 50 states, um, which is, to me, absolutely absurd. Uh, like I said, we already recognize spanking as sexual battery when one adult does it to another adult. Um, I cannot for the life of me imagine why sexual battery would stop being sexual battery just because your victim is a child. What I believe is that we most definitely have to stop um, talking about harm doers or perpetrators as evil monsters. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't serve anybody to do that. Um, what we have done for the longest time is this, um, we've had one kind of way of deal, no, actually two kinds of ways of dealing with this sort of trauma. It's either keep quiet uh -huh. or it's about going through the legal system. Right. Um, and that avenue is not the avenue that many people want uh -huh. to take. In talking to survivors, many survivors said I, I never even considered the idea of going to the police. What did I want? I wanted it to stop. Right. I wanted my family to know. And that's just totally reoccurring. Uh -huh. Some people it works for. Um, but 
even within that legal system, it, it, it's a process of demonizing, um, at most times, the survivor, depending on who the survivor was, but this ostracizing or, like, ousting of... Uh, kind of an otherness. Yeah, the villain. And then it's like, okay, now we can forget about that mm-hmm. person and we can move on, but it really doesn't do anything. Right. Doing that doesn't actually heal uh, mm-hmm. the person. Maybe it might help a little in some senses but there's a long road to healing and then that person what sort of support and services are they going to get and we often talk about um harm doers as you know let them go to prison so that they can get a taste of what they've done Mm -hmm. and even though you know i would say that that is a legitimate feeling to have for people who are Mm -hmm. suffering um it's not the answer contracting age play, regression, looking after um, that uh, dominant submissive part that's going to be cared for and how that looks like. Because some people will want sexual age play, others will not want it and others will find it absolutely repulsive because it is nothing to do with this. So you have to work out what, you know, your specific... um, interweave is and so when I'm working therapeutically with someone and we're doing infancy I will suggest things that they can do but I have also done things with them like a bedtime story so we're replacing a historic bad memory with a new historic bad memory so I know you're in your adult body but we're soothing your amygdala to switch into oh yes I remember what it was like to be scared at bedtime and now we're going to work through those emotions and we're going to do it several times until this story doesn't evoke trigger it evokes soothing and we have sort of soothed that scar on your on your on your memory on your somatics on your on your nervous system on your neuroscience all those sort of things I mean, on the scale, you have people who believe in human rights and believe that we all, you know, should have these rights realized, including children, but they might not feel comfortable with some aspects of children's rights. But of course, you also have on the other spectrum, those who actually misuse children's rights to justify their own agenda. And we have, you know, some examples that are particularly horrendous, for example, um, what are called the um, anti, anti-gay laws that we've seen across uh, you know, Russia and other Eastern European countries that have been passed to allegedly um, protect children from harmful information. And these laws are obviously homophobic, um, but they use the language of the poor little children need to be protected from you know, um, what they call... Um, Gay propaganda. I think one of the things that struck me is a lot of society's investment, as is true across the whole criminal justice system, is into the detection and punishment of offenders, and hardly any of it is invested into the prevention of these crimes in the first place. So that's something now that I'm, you know, we're talking about as a foundation. I'm raising it with other organisations like us around the world, and saying what can we do to take a stronger um, approach to preventing when I say preventing intercepting men in that pathway that they take when they move from one piece of material to another and end up watching you know really horrible material of children being abused no one starts like that no one's born like that there's a journey they undertake how do we intercept that journey what can technology do what can counselling do there's some very interesting things happening in Finland and Sweden where they're linking the detection of, of material to the provision of, of counselling services to men who recognise there's kind of a problem with what they're, what they're doing. And that's something I'd like to kind of generalise and, and do more proactively in this country. It's funny that you bring up obscenity because it's such a broad statute that allows for the banning of really anything. Um, you know, you know it when you see it, right? And so obscenity has historically, of course, been used to ban all sorts of things from sex toys to to the content that you talk about. Um, I think that, you know, I do think that it's actually really important to keep these concepts separate. Again, I think that it's important to measure the real harm. And of course, when we're talking about children, the real harm occurs to actual human beings who are involved in a situation that 
is not, you know, up for debate. Um, but when it comes to fiction, I think that it's a different circumstance. Um, and yes, I, certainly we should be bringing in academics, we should be bringing in scientists to weigh the real arms of this, but um, I'm not sure that a blanket ban serves this kind of purpose. So I'd like to see assessment and treatment and mentorship and supervision in the community by concerned adults. I'd like to see much more of that and much less uh, uh, punishment or punitive um, kinds of approaches. I think the most important thing that we can do is get kids to a point where they can be solid citizens and um, as with as little punishment as possible. End of the day, bottom line, my what all of my career boils down to is punishment on its own doesn't work. Treatment can work, and treatment combined with the right supervision and family involvement can work even better. There have been a couple of times where a person will call us and say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm really worried. I'm about to watch this child. I'm sexually attracted to this child, and I just feel like, uh, I just feel like I may cross the line and I'm really worried. I don't want to do that. Um, what should I do? And we kind of talk to them about, you know, what they can do in those moments. Is there a way that you can call this parent and cancel on them? Can you make up an excuse? Um, a lot of times folks are in a bind because that may not feel like an option to them. Maybe they can't, they, you know, this parent is like solely relying on them if they don't um, have this person watch their child then they're going to lose their job and they're, you know, that will mean that they'll lose their, it's, right. you know, all these building blocks on top of each other, then they're going to lose their the place where they live. And, and that just doesn't feel accessible to them. So if it feels like that's not an option for them, then we'll talk about other things they can do. Like, you know, can you have a friend over to be there when you're watching this child? You know, let's talk about the boundaries that you need to respect around this child. Like, let's talk about a safety plan that you want to keep in place. Make sure that you don't bathe, dress, change this child, don't let them sit on your lap, stay away from any physical affection, practice saying these words aloud that, hey, I'm not comfortable with hugs, or hey, how about a high five only? Um, and then we give them like all the emergency tools as well. Um, right. I, I guess even but before that, but we can also talk to them about, you know, where physically in the environment they may end up being with the child. So of course, a public place would be helpful. Can you be around other people? Um, and then, yeah, just the emergency measures. If you absolutely feel like you end up in an unsafe spot, go to the hospital, say that you're worried may harm this child, um, and they can kind of help you from there. CSAM is the most regulated content by internet companies. They take the greatest steps to try to prevent it from being distributed and to respond to it once they identify it. Um, there's nothing else that is even close in terms of the... the um, uh, the, the, uh, the investment on the part of the internet companies to come about. Um, so what I can't tell is what Congress thinks uh, the internet companies are going to do that they're not currently doing that should be done that actually won't cause massive collateral damage or possibly little or no gain. And the answer is maybe Congress doesn't really care about CCM. Maybe this is the back door for a censorship board called the commission to promulgate a bunch of things that will crack down on internet content more generally and the fact that it might be done a help with CSAM is almost like a side benefit. Um, so there's a lot of skepticism about uh, the real goal of trying to up the game of the internet companies to fight CSAM, given the state of the art today. Me personally, I've actually never talked about this um, in relation to my industry work, but I think I'm finally ready to talk about it. So I think with you guys is the perfect example. I was uh, the victim of a like a grooming thing, but I want to make sure I emphasize the point that it was very nuanced. I've talked about it a lot in my therapy sessions and it wasn't something like there was just this like evil predator, you know, taking advantage of a young girl. And like, yes, that's what happened. But he also wasn't that old either. There were, there were genuine, um, at least on my, on my end, there were genuine feelings for him, as there are with many kids who are groomed. But with him, it wasn't, um, while there might have been some malintent, I also know deep in my heart that that wasn't the whole story. And what happens to me a lot when I tell people about this experience 
is they just paint him as this evil person. And it actually negates my feelings about what I went through and how when he left me, it left me in pieces because I didn't understand. And the reason that he was able to come into my life was because I had no other sexual outlets. I had no one talking to me about sex. I had no one showing me that my sexual urges were normal and okay and they loved me for it. So I had to go seek that love somewhere else. And so there was an opportunity there for him to exploit that younger sexuality and be the person to show me what's what's what. Um, and if somebody had talked to me about sex, if somebody had told me it was okay to masturbate, maybe I wouldn't have never, like maybe I never would have let him as close to me as I did. So that's how we stop it. When we realized we hit this roadblock with the police, what we decided to do was to kind of tackle it from the legal angle. All of the case law about BDSM says that consent is not a defense to assault, which is what Consent Counts was created originally to decriminalize BDSM. So we started working with the American Law Institute who are revising the model penal code on sexual assault. There was no definition of consent in the model penal code on sexual assault. How in the world can you decide if somebody's been assaulted or not if, if, you, if there's no roadmap? And that's the problem with prosecutors. They'll get a case and they say, we believe that this person has assaulted five members of the kink community, but we don't understand how to explain it to the jury or to the judge. Um, so we, we were like, okay, we'll give you the roadmap. Um, so we worked with the American Law Institute and um, helped create their definition of consent, which is uh, a very interesting definition of consent because it actually, you know, it defines that it's a person's willingness to engage in sexual acts. It's, uh, it can be expressed or it can be inferred from behavior, both action and inaction, but it has to be taken in the context of the circumstances. So if it's somebody you've never been with before, you know, the circumstances say that's, you don't have a pattern of behavior with that person, right? right? So, whereas if it's somebody you've been with for 20 years and you have a pattern of behavior with that person, you can take that into account. It keeps that artificial thing always having to ask, may I touch you here? May I touch you here? Which we know in the kink community is unworkable. You want to ask that beforehand. <laughs> you want to get all that clear before everybody's all hot and bothered, right? And, and then you go into the arena that you've created and you play, right? So we wanted some of this in the, in the definition of consent. And one of the things that was very important was that consent can be revoked or withdrawn at any time. If you don't have a definition of consent, then you don't have a definition of how that consent can be withdrawn. And that's typically what's happening in these situations where somebody um, either doesn't give consent to begin with, they're kind of bowled over, and when they try to withdraw consent, that's not taken into account because it's like, well, why did you go up to the, the, the apartment then? You know what I mean? Why did you kiss them then? You know, it's no, like, I mean. well, you can withdraw at some point. <laughs> that's why. Right. So we're very excited about this because we think that this will um, – you know, help not just people in the kink and non-monogamy community, but help everybody because it's a more realistic view of what um, how consent works in sexual interactions. Comprehensive sex ed should talk about consent and boundaries, for example. Another really important piece is knowing what our anatomy is called. One thing that we know is that children who use terms like down there or they don't know the correct names for their genitalia, they might say, somebody touched me down there. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean their leg? Does that mean their penis? Does that mean inside their vagina? I mean, those are really important um, facts that that can make or break the way a case moves forward and whether somebody will talk to an adult. When somebody has shame about their genitalia, for example, they're probably not gonna feel comfortable going to an adult and saying, somebody touched me where I feel so, you know, we have so much shame around it sometimes that we almost kind of 
pretend it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when somebody crosses a line and does something inappropriate or hurtful or abusive, we need to be able to have comfort around even the most basic language. Mm -hmm. And we know that when people do know the terms for their anatomy and they do have sex positive upbringing and education, they are better able to seek the help that they need. So with stigma, so that is the process of um, attaching a discredited label or a discreditable status to an individual or to a, a group of people. Um, so this can have some severe negative effects on that individual. And I find that in terms of being positive, I understand where they're going in terms of their thinking that if it is socially unacceptable, therefore people won't think about offending. But in actual fact, when you are doing that, all you're doing is encouraging an individual to be um, more closed up. So in effect, that has a very uh, has a lot of negative connotations to that. So by doing that, all you're doing is that person who is minor attracted, um, that label of being, you know, um, a sex offender that's a predatory um, sex offender that's out there to um, um, abuse children, um, all that does is sort of bury them underground almost. They go more, um, it becomes a more isolated area. And since I have mentioned before that these individuals do suffer from a, an array of uh, mental health problems, um, and sometimes range from very significant to minor, depending on the situation, but for someone who is trying to prevent um, abuse, all you're doing is driving the problem away for some people where that, um, I don't want to call it temptation, but you see what I mean as being something that is um, a problem. Yeah. You're, you're, you're just burying the problem, you're not solving the problem. And these people are just people at the end of the day, as well as, because um, you know, I'm just talking about people with a minor attraction here. So those people are just like you and I, but they um, have this issue that they need to address. And the more and more you drive them underground, the more and more that their mental health problems will get worse. And potentially, you might not be able to have stopped a, 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 a minor attracted person who is um uh, who could take that forward into being an abusive situation. So in effect, by doing that, you are not achieving your ultimate goal. For me as a survivor, this was never um, talked about in any of my safe places, right? So this, my parents never had a prevention conversation with me. My school never had a prevention conversation with me. Um, the church that I went to never had a prevention conversation with me. So this was never mentioned in any of my safe places, so I concluded as a kid, this must be something that's not okay to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so we can't expect kids to be the first individual to open that you know, communication with an adult. And so it helps facilitate that um, conversation and open that door of communication for them that if this has happened, this is a safe place to tell, I'm a safe adult to tell. Um, and it really, really does help when it comes to, um, you know, how difficult that process can be for kids. And that's Prestigia Conversations for today. Um, thank you for joining us. And thank you for supporting Prestasia and for, um, yeah, supporting the work that we do. Uh, it's been great to be the host of this and to get a chance to interview great people and talk about child protection work. Um, thanks again. Mm -hmm.